Wow, this got quite, quite fast. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Alejandro Hernandez. I am principal with Stantec Architecture, and I also have the privilege and the honor to be the American Institute of Architects Dallas Chapter President for this year of 2021. We are very pleased to uh, welcome you all to tonight's event that promises to be a very lively conversation about what makes cities more livable and humane. All of us, I'm sure, over the past 18 years or 18 months or so, have been uh, coming to appreciate a lot more our parks, green areas, even the streets, which, uh, of course, we all understand now are essential to our uh, civic infrastructure. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having us, for opening the doors of this amazing museum, a jewel of Dallas, one of my favorite places here. Thank you, thank you so much to you and your old staff in La Maria. Thank you as well. Thank you for your help. It is my pleasure to introduce Mark Lamster and Jim Burnett. Mark and Jim are both wonderful advocates for what is important principles of civic life, each on their own way and in different areas of influence. Mark Lamster is an architecture critic of the Dallas Morning News, a professor in the Architecture School of Art at the University of Arlington in, uh, University of Texas in Arlington, and Lowe Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He is one of the most influential writers and thinkers covering architecture, urbanism, and design today, and one of only a handful of architectural critics contributing to a daily national newspaper. Dallas is very fortunate to consider his keen analysis and thinking about all matters relating to design in the city. Mark has been a contributing editor of the Architectural Review Design Observer and ID, and writes often for Architect, Architectural Record, and Metropolis, among other design titles. His work has appeared frequently in national publications and magazines, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Wall Street Journal. Mark's biography of the late architect Philip Johnson, The Man in the Glass House, published by Little Brown in 2018, was finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography. In 2021, he was awarded the prestigious 50,000 Rapkin Prize for Arts Journalism. Tonight, we also welcome Mark's class of UTA. We hope to hear very good questions from you guys once the Mark's and Jim's conversations is over. Talking about Jim Burnett, he founded Landscape Architecture Practice, the office of James Burnett in Houston in 1981. He has continued to lead OJB for more than 30 years. The firm now has five offices across the country with nearly 100 employees. In, in 2020, OJB was recognized with the National Design Award for the Copper Hewitt Smithsonian National Design Museum of Landscape Architecture. With more than 100 national state and design awards for excellence, including the firm award for the American Society of Landscape Architects in 2015, OJB has continued to push the boundary of sustainable and equitable design practices. Jim is also the recipient of the ASLA Design Medal for his ongoing commitment to the profession and exemplary body sustained work. Here in Dallas, Jim led the transformation of Clyde Warren Park for, from a multi-lane highway into what is the most visited public open space in the city. Clyde Warren Park was one of the first among most successful examples of reclaiming spaces from roadways into a structured deck parks a model that has been adopted in cities across the country. Jim is a frequent speaker and doer on matters related to responsible placemaking and healing places. His work includes the design 
of master plans, corporate campuses, academic landscapes, cultural and civic institutions, health and wellness facilities, urban parks and other complex urban projects. Several of these projects highlighted, are highlighted in the Envisioning Landscapes, his first monograph, which will be part of tonight's conversation. Finally, we'd like to thank Monticelli Press and OJB for their support to tonight's programs and donation of their beautiful book, Envisioning Landscapes. A reminder to, to everybody tonight, proceeds will benefit the K-12 education programs from the Architectural and Design Exchange, ADEX, and the Architectural and Design Foundation, which allows students to not only learn about the career path in architecture, design, and engineering, but also to explore how to use design to become better stewards of their neighborhoods and champions for a more functional, beautiful, and equitable city. We invite you all to get a copy of this book with a donation of $25 or more to the addicts. With that, it's my great privilege and honor to introduce you guys to Mark and Jim. You guys, take it away. Thank you, I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks. So can we get a copy of the book to put up on the table here, somebody? <laughs> Should have one here. Ooh, break. There we go, how about that? Well, it's even wrapped. Very fancy. Hi, Jim. Okay, Mark, how are you? I'm, I'm holding it oh, together. Can we take these off? Oh, yeah. yeah. Superman. <laughs> well, uh, I, Alejandro, that was a really nice introduction. Thank you. And I also feel the same way about this museum. It is such a special place. And uh, only in Dallas would you commit this kind of institution, this, these kind of resources, and these kind of, this kind of design with Renzo and Pete to, uh, for sculpture. Uh, the first time we got to see it, we were walking over to meet Val Haas for a hard hat tour uh, with our friends from Crescent. And uh, we walked over the bridge, single file, over the Harwood Bridge, and you know it was shaking. And, and uh, as we walked back, uh, one of the gentlemen from Crescent Real Estate said, uh, do you think our guest from the Ritz-Carlton will come over to see the Sculpture Center uh, by walking? And I said, I think they're going to take the house car, they're going to get a cab. I mean, it, it, it's so brutal. There were no trees getting over here. It was hot. It, we were sweating like crazy. And uh, so I, 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 that's really where a lot of the park, the Clydemore Park began. We, uh, they said, well, would you do some studies? And we, of course, being hungry architects, jump, jumped at the chance to do a deck park. And, and we That's started. the best thing about the Crescent, is it created Clyde Warren Park. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, come on, Mark. There Philip you go. Johnson's work, worst project. <laughs> yeah. So uh, off we go. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I, a, I'm just the side entertainment here. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, I, what I thought I would do is just fin mention a few words about the history of our firm and, and uh, one of my partners, Chip Tragesser, is here and he's responsible for a lot of these uh, projects and ideas that we put together. We, we have a very collaborative studio atmosphere. Uh, it's not uh, every idea counts and we really listen to, uh, to the people in the team, um, everyone, interns, the, the, the whole team really has uh, a pen in their hand when we talk, so it's really great. And and our Dallas team is here: Tara Chandler, Katie. Uh, who else is with us? Frank. Frank. Oh, Frank is here too. So, uh, so I wanted just to uh, tell you about how we started the firm. This is not advancing. I don't know. Um, they'll get that fixed. But uh, you know, we. I want Fran to take over the lecture. <laughs> Sorry. I started working for a large architecture firm uh, for the first five years of my career, and then uh, still not working. 
uh, and then maybe you can advance it for me. Um, and then uh, got this opportunity to work on a healthcare project, uh, year one of opening the firm. And that uh, opportunity was for the Sisters of Charity, a uh, Catholic organization that really believed in the arts and uh, how that was a big part of the healing process. They believed in nature, had a role in healing. And that was 1990, 1991. And that was a great launch, kind of launch for the firm because ever since then, I think all of our projects, we look at them through the lens of uh, what does it really feel like to be in that space? How long would you stay there? Is this a transition space? Is this a place where you, you actually would enjoy uh, being connected to nature, you would, you know, you get recharged. You would have a kind of a restorative experience. Or is this a space that uh, that is is uh, going to be uh, over designed or or you know cooked too much? And I, I think that we still talk a lot about uh, the experience of being in spaces now with 3D Oculus goggles and VR and uh, um, all of the software we have, we can actually walk through the space and point at things and talk about um, you know, what's working, what's not working, and that's really helped um, elevate the process and give us more time to process new ideas. Uh, so we began in healthcare. We continued that kind of analysis today, even though you know, our projects are not all healthcare. We were really not dealing with people who were undergoing uh, acute illness or health challenges, but we, we still want to understand um, all the elements because you know our work is, is all outdoors and we're really dealing with uh, the sun, the cold, the, the heat, the, uh, the wind. Sound is maybe the biggest assault on our senses right now in a lot of urban areas. How do you mitigate that is, is always a challenge. So, um, and then we started also with smaller projects like at Rice um, and, uh, and some courtyard projects in Houston. The firm started in Houston, uh, moved to California when we won the Salk Institute Master Plan. So we had two offices and then moved from California to Boston. And then the last two offices in the last five years were uh, Philadelphia and Dallas. We have an office that um, overlooks the Clyde Warren Park here that Tara Green uh, is in charge of. But um, you know, we were always acutely aware of what it felt like in those spaces. How, what, what happens when your foot walks on the gravel and it registers in your brain that you're, you know, you're in a garden. Uh, how the shade keeps you there longer. How what the sound of water does, uh, you know, to your senses and how that helps to kind of decompress, de-stress. Um, these projects continued for the first couple of decades. And then uh, the projects that really got the most excitement in the, in the office were public realm. And uh, those were you know, the opportunity to do something that everybody could go to. They're not behind a, a wall, or you don't have to have a pass, or have to work there to go to these corporate campuses. And, and even college campuses sometimes felt a little like, like you were not going to you know, go and spend the afternoon at, a, at Rice. But uh, I think when we started doing public work, it really hit home and it became the most coveted kind of uh, assignments in the studio. And our first project was Lakeshore East in Chicago. It's a five acre park, which is the centerpiece of um, nine million square foot development. Uh, Jeannie Gang's Aqua Towers on that park. And there's some other notable buildings in Chicago that overlook that park. But uh, the point of showing you this is that um, I think we're at a real critical time right now where you know, there's proposals. I know they vary. The Build Back Better program is, is all over the map right now. But, but there's a lot of money for infrastructure. And uh, I think it's extremely important that infrastructure should be green infrastructure. It should be designed. It should have uh, planners and architects and critics and landscape architects and uh, the whole community involved in, in the rebuilding of our cities. Because we know what's happening. There's 18, I saw last night on the news, there's been 18 natural disasters since the first of the year, over a billion dollars each. Uh, the total is 104 billion. We've surpassed last year. There were 22 natural disasters, over a billion. 
uh, these things are going to keep coming. Climate change is real. It's going to um, how we manage stormwater, how we manage drainage, how these big events are going to come through. Uh, so we need to plan uh, with things like the Trinity River and some of these larger uh, carrying capacity kind of drainage ways in mind because we will need them. Um, so, you know, I think another thing, Alejandro said it uh, to begin here, that 18 months has been very challenging f for most of us and, uh, and very, very challenging for a lot of us. And um, I think that parks, open space, connecting with nature was that moment each day um, where you kind of reset. You could, you know, go outside, maybe walk your dog, maybe just, just kind of take a deep breath before you went back to more calls or, you know, the zooms and all of the things we've been we've been dealing with. Um, they also were places where the community came together, where water was distributed, um, food, uh, testing, uh, free speech became a real big deal um, in all of our public spaces, and I think that. Uh, you know, we realized that the town green, the, the square, the piazza, that these spaces are really important, that we need to build in flexibility for things that, that uh, you know, we're not sure uh, exactly what's, what's coming next, but we, we definitely don't want to be. Uh, we, I talked to Mark's students today about Clydeborn Park has a lot of flexibility built into it. You can have a lot of different things. You can even have different things happening at the same time. And that was purposeful. We didn't want to kind of over-design it because we felt like it needed to um, be um, very open and, f and for the people and that you could get through it if you wanted to. You could stop. Uh, there's nine kind of entry points and we really didn't want it to become kind of an ego-driven design. We want it to be simple, straightforward, and a place where it could handle a lot of different activities, some that we, we weren't even aware were coming. Um, again, this Build Back Better infrastructure projects that are coming up are really important. Uh, we need poets, we need artists, we need painters, we need critics, we need, uh, we need more people than the big five engineering firms building our cities again. Uh, you know, we don't want to replace old concrete with new concrete. I think we really want to um, have uh, big dialogues about how we spend this money, how we make things um, more intimate. You know, roadways shouldn't be four lanes going to the freeway to get everybody out. I mean, let's look at, let's look at things a little bit differently. Let's look at the 10 minute city, the walkable city, the, you know, parks becoming something that that happen in a reasonable dimension. There's a number of organizations, ULI, the Trust for Public Land, uh, that are <clears throat> working on this idea that if you lived in a metropolitan area, you'd always be 10 minutes away from a park. And uh, I think that's a great idea. I also want to mention that um, Dallas is way ahead of the curve on a lot of cities that we work in, where uh, Willis and, and Paul and, and uh, Mayor Laura and others, I think back in the day, 2004, Downtown Park's master plan was brilliant because it really set up these placeholders uh, for the parks that are now being completed. And it's, there's a great collection of urban parks in Dallas, unlike uh, most cities in this country. And uh, so I think, um, I know there's the 360 plan, there's a lot of things cooking, Trinity River, and others. I'm not, uh, I don't propose to be up to date on all the different initiatives, but I do think we want to keep the net wide open, involve the community, really get to the, the meat of the discussion. And uh, as we always say, no one knows a neighborhood better than the people that live there. So when we come in and we're the out of town guys and we're flying into Cleveland or Kansas City or something, you know, we have to really uh, use the consensus building process. And, uh, and, and listen and uh, understand what people are thinking. These are, I'm gonna touch on just a few principles that we uh, work with and we believe in, and we don't specifically say on every project, okay, you know, is that principle five or four or whatever, but these are things that we really have found that uh, 
make sense and they really do help the planning process of open space, um, parks, and kind of um, models like Clyburn Park and other cities that we worked on. And I'm just going to run through a couple of them. The first, as I just said, is uh, listen, 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 like listen to the people. Um, they, some of the best ideas come from the people who um, are, you know, throwing some of the cookie out in the beginning and then you start thinking about it. You go, okay, well, maybe that really could happen. And, uh, and so a lot of those things make it into the program and ultimately end up being, um, you know, sometimes a very successful part of the park and give it that unique character that, you know, kind of uh, makes it authentic to that, to that area, to that city. I think um, design uh, equitably means fair, right? That you are looking at the whole city. Let's not look at the uh, high income areas, the where um, all the tax base is going to come from. But look at the whole city. Like, I think cities really need to zoom out and to you know say how do we how do we spread these initiatives around and make sure that that uh, all the neighborhoods get their fair share and. Uh, I'm not always saying like uh, like that. Uh, I w I'm not saying you would do a Clyde Warren, make a Clyde Warren Park in certain parts of the city, um, because Clyde Warren Park is is appropriate. I think in a lot of ways, we hired um, Tom Pfeiffer, and we thought he was the right guy because of his understanding of something really beautiful, and um, you know the stainless and glass and the modern uh, aesthetic that he had. A lot of the moves in the park were uh, thought to be um, responsive to the arts district. We didn't really want it to be a park that would have art. We have sculpture gardens and museums, the best in the world right here. So it was really meant to be almost like a pre-function space. You go there, you have your lunch, you listen to some music, you come over here, or you come over here, you go over there. Uh, but it was meant to be more of like um, a place where you could get outside, breathe some fresh air, you know, enjoy the trees. People watching is probably the, the best thing that happens. You know, if you ask people what do they really like, it's just to see other people. So um, I think designing um, for the whole community and that project that previously was in Oklahoma City, and uh, that's a children's garden. There are over a million people in the greater Oklahoma City area. Most school kids have taken a field trip to that park and experienced that children's garden. And they're our best customers because they tell their parents and they come back on the weekends. And so you've got a lot of people coming back, looking at downtown. Residential guys are starting to build apartments. Things are starting to happen. People are imagining they could office in downtown again. So <clears throat> downtown has really gotten a revival in a lot of ways by, you know, kind of really, really peculiar things like, like having a really good children's garden in which the kids come in and and start to talk about they want to go back on that weekend. Uh, find, find overlooked opportunities. That's going to be the key going forward with this money. Uh, what do you, how do you put all this capacity for stormwater? How do you, uh, how do you scrub the air? How do you um, put in a million trees? How do you, you know, where do you find this land? It's we can't go and buy all this. Land acquisition is a really tough thing with our parks, but. Uh, I think where there's a will, there's a way, and I think Clyde Warren was one of those ideas. It was really one um, idea his time had come, and I think having, uh, having that aha moment and then having people that really believed in it through a recession, they championed that project. There, So many other clients would have walked away in 2009, and uh, Jody Grant and uh, the board and Sheila really never stopped pushing on that. and. Um, in fact, the stimulus in, in 2009 was the kicker that got us into construction. So I think um, you'd be surprised where you can find the next Clyde Warren Park. It may be, it may be a vacant lot somewhere nearby, or it may, be, uh, it may be just narrowing one of these 80 foot wide streets that only needs to be 24 feet. Well, you know, we, are, we are decking. We, we, there is, we, are, we are decking mad now in Dallas. Thanks. You, Clyde you guys have taken that idea pretty, pretty far. So, uh, um, yeah, the decking is, uh, is, is going well. I, I, think, I think it's great. 
And you've got Fair Park. I mean, it, it, there's no shortage of cool projects and, well, that are green initiatives in Dallas. Yeah, well, I mean, we've, we've done more harm to ourselves with highways than most cities. Therefore, there's more opportunity to undo <laughs> the harm. <laughs> You, you mean we don't need another spaghetti bowl out at the, uh, you know, <laughs> don't even think about it. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I also want to mention that these kinds of projects, this is uh, 1,800 acres north of Houston. Uh, it's near Spring Creek. It's, uh, it's called Spring Woods, and it's a series of um, eight or nine basins that step down, and they hold tremendous amount of water, and during Harvey, this saved uh, neighborhoods from being flooded. So you'll start to see more projects that are park until it's flooding, and then there are floodways and drainage ways and uh, you know, uh, places to kind of let the water perk back into the ground. But uh, we, uh, you know, we really believe in that. Um, I think design for life is really important. I mean, a lot of people will, would probably question that you know, in a way. You're in an urban environment. Um, come on, are you really going to put bee boxes and uh, and you know have butterfly gardens and pollinator gardens and all that in in the city? I think you absolutely will do that, and, and you should do that. And a lot of these roofs could be habitat, uh, could be biodiverse habitat. So I think designing for life. We used to in the healthcare world when I started in my career, we would say patient-centered care. Um, because if, we, if the patient wasn't here, we, no one would be here. You wouldn't design a hospital. There'd be no nurses, no aides, no doctors. But then everyone kind of graduated. They, they raised their consciousness. We went from patient-centered care to human-centered care, which meant that everybody involved in the medical profession in the hospital environment would be, uh, we'd have to design for them. We have to design for their breaks, for people to how they access the facility, how they handle treatments, all those things. So, so everybody involved would, was human-centered care. And I think now there's a really great awareness that, um, that the cycle of life is really important, that um, all the critters, all the fish, all the clean water, all the air, the health of the air, the, you know, the, the air pollution that, that we see, these big numbers along freeways that, that, uh, that are really, you know, very toxic in a lot of ways, that we've got to take all that seriously. We've got to create ways to mitigate that, to scrub that, to clean that, to, to filter that, to pr create healthy cities. Because um, if we don't take care of it, you know, you see, you see what happens. The end result is, uh, is uh, you know, we're, we're, we become more in a healthcare crisis. You know, our rates of incidence for, for different types of uh, lung diseases, asthma and emphysema and different diseases are very high in areas that are highly polluted. So it's, that's no surprise. So we need to make our new cities very healthy, very green. Um, and uh, I think it's the way we'll get back. Um, this is Oklahoma City and uh, during urban renewal, IMP came into town and uh, proposed there'd be Tivoli Gardens, and he tore down, I think, over 100 beautiful old brick buildings. Some probably weren't not that beautiful, but the Biltmore Hotel, there were some notable buildings that were taken down in Oklahoma City. And he made these big super blocks, and one of the super blocks is Myriad Gardens, this 15-acre track up here, and um, then he made the convention center, you know, the site for the convention center, parking decks, and um, a car lot over here. So we were uh, asked to come in to help uh, with this Dead and Energy's new headquarters, and then help with Mary Gardens across the street. Um, just as the, the IMP, when IMP died and all the encomium came out, no one talked about Oklahoma City. <laughs> Well, um, you know, uh, I do admire IMP very much, but this was not the highlight of his career. This, yeah, this was not one that worked. It, it, there were some strange ideas. One of them was that you would uh, you would actually uh, go down 20 feet from street level down to the uh, water level, and that there would be restaurants tucked into the side of the hill, and that you would dine down there by the water. These little water canals. Uh, it. You know, of course, it never materialized. They had hardly enough money to kind of manage the, 
the security and the safety. They took all the spoil from the water, digging the pond, and piled it up at the corners, which is really a kind of a, that's me doing this? I'm sorry. All right, I gotta fix this. Um, so they piled it up on the corners, and it really made uh, no way to get into the park. So you had to go to the mid block to find your way into the park. Um, so uh, we were asked to kind of help um, reorganize the park. We dealt with every square foot of this park and um, took a lot of the canal and turned it into a, a lawn space. We created uh, botanical gardens. It was always called Mirror Botanical Gardens, but it never really truly was a botanical garden because they just didn't have the resources. But the money from this came from Devin building their headquarters, taking all the taxes for 20 years, forward then, forwarding them into a bond, and then uh, creating a TIF. And so that money was spent on the $40 million to redo Mary Gardens. It's now the kind of heart of downtown. It's become a, a big, a big uh, attraction for the city. Um, so the great thing is we had 15 acres to work with, um, and now it's... Uh, it really is uh, great to see this. And they subsequently have a MAPS project, and they're, they've done another large park. So Oklahoma City gets it. They're, they're big on uh, sports. They're also big on uh, green infrastructure. And they, they've turned that city around. They were considered the fattest city in America uh, in 2000 and uh, maybe four or five. And the mayor said, um, we're going we're gonna to fix this. and so. He uh, brought in Jeff Speck, the walkability consultant. They really looked at their streets. We helped them replan their downtown, and they now uh, have very narrow streets, street trees, uh, wide sidewalks with, with trees, and, and they're starting to see a lot of resurgence downtown. So they've turned everything around from the one-way system to, to uh, two-way two -way drives through town. Uh, make place, not space. I think that's um, something we talk about. We talk about the Chip and I always talk about the chandelier and you know what's what's really special. What's what's going to make people want to come back? What's the going to uh, you know create an emotional response? And this project for Levy Park in Houston was really about getting children up to the height of live oak trees and putting them in the trees through this kind of deck bridge um, overlook. And so. Um, you know, I think that's something that we try to do. So we're, we're not always trying to just make it so uniform that anything can happen. We do design in really important features that become uh, kind of um, you know, notable aha moments as you move into through these landscapes, through the parks. I think creating a, a pavilions that shade just like the one here at Clyde Warren and then they transform in every hour, really, and at Levy Park during the during the day. On a Saturday, that that deck is changing. For uh, Lenore Annenberg, she wanted to create um, a garden for the community at Sunnylands in Rancho Mirage, where um, she wanted to be an immersive natural nature experience. But at the same time, she didn't really want to see that this site was mostly blow sand uh, coming. Uh, through the desert, she wanted it to be a lush botanical uh, desert garden. So it sounds a little contradictory, but but we were able to overplant everything so close that when you walk through there, it's not gravel and rock and sand. It's really uh, a, a kind of a plant explosion, a plant immersion. And so you, you move through that space and you really get a, a strong dose of nature, you also get color. It, it does things that a lot of desert gardens don't do. It's changing all the time. So um, I think the indulge in nature is something we should do when we work on these, these new projects. And finally, I just want to close with a, a couple of comments about Clyde Warren Park. And uh, I, I, I've you know, mentioned some already, but I do think that uh, uh, it's, it's a special uh, project because it uh, it really didn't require any real estate. It's a, it's you know, it's a hanging garden created out of thin air. It's on top of trucks going 70 miles an hour, which is is kind of amazing feat. Uh, we had a great team. Um, we when the idea got going, and and there was always kind of the room to do it. So the roadbed was was okay. The walls had to be replaced. The center divide had to be made, and so there was a lot of work that went into this project, and. Uh, 
I think, again, the key to this was um, never killing the idea, like always saying, uh, okay, we'll figure that out. And we had a brilliant structural engineer, Mir Ali from, from uh, Carter and Burgess, which became Jacobs, and he was uh, soft-spoken but really knew what he was doing, and so we were able to kind of lay these Legos in and drop the slabs every third beam. So you actually, when you're in the park, it feels like these trees are at grade. But most of the park is about 9 to 12 inches of soil. So it's concrete right underneath it. But it, when you're out there, you don't feel it shake. You don't feel like you're not on terra firma. So I think that was those were some of the successes of the park. Um, this was that day when we walked over and um, and, and we looked out and said, you know, this is this is going to be uh, this is going to be a real challenge to figure this out. I, I guess we originally thought that that those walls would hold the beams, and you know that it wouldn't be such a such a big undertaking. It added quite a bit to to have to tear down those side walls and build new side walls. Um, you know, I think that um, deck parks are a growing movement. I think Clyde Warren helped some of this. There are over 100 new deck parks in the country right now. Sorry that the map didn't make it in the transition, but there is a US map on here underneath. It's just really faint. You, you can't see it. But, um, and it's OK. The United States seems to be disappearing, <laughs> falling apart at the moment. Well, there's a canal. We're cutting off Florida. You know, you heard about that, right? Uh, great. <laughs> No one so will uh, <clears throat> anyway, the uh, you know the first workshops some were uh, they were held in multiple locations, but one of them was held in this room right here, and it was really uh, great. It was about 20 degrees, and I remember people walking back in and like, are you are you serious? You know, we're we really going to cover up the freeway and make a park for people. There's people screaming along on the feeder row going 60 miles an hour. There's you know noise. There's uh, you know, motor banks on the other side, and uh, I don't, I don't know that anybody's going to be here. There's nobody lives around here. It's, you know, this is uh, where would they park? You know, that was a big question for, for like five years. Where, how do you get here? Um, so all those things got worked out, and I think uh, where there's a will, there's a way. You know, Texas Capital Bank started opening their garage. The trolley did its thing. It flipped around. The uh, uh, on-street parking became a real deal. Uh, the city worked with us to slow the traffic on the feeder road, so it wasn't these 60 mile an hour ramps. It was really, people were slowing down. They were actually watching people in the park, too. Street trees helped that. Um, a lot of things came together. The food trucks added another dimension we never imagined. So th there's no food trucks on that list, and nobody had mentioned we should make a place for food trucks. That was a aha moment that came after we realized that the restaurant wouldn't be completed in time. Um, I'm sure you know the story, but again, 2004, we had already been designing the park, and the Willis put it into the master plan, and then it got its $20 million during the bond. It was matched by some very generous civic leaders, and uh, which you see a lot of in Dallas, which is really, really, again, pretty amazing. You don't have that kind of support in a lot of cities, um, but it was able to get Built, started 2009, finished 2012. I think next year will be the 10 year anniversary. Um, the split is pretty even on uh, city, state, federal, uh, and private. And I, I'm not up uh, with, with the latest with Kit and all the latest fundraising. These, these numbers may be a little old. I apologize for that. But I do know that it's pretty phenomenal that 55 million was raised from the community. Um, and that the city and state and uh, fed, federal uh, government was able to kind of split that. Um, a lot of good things happen with the park. Uh, we talk about the park being a success kind of through the design phase and getting it completed, but it really became a success when we turned the keys over to, to Tara Green and Jody and the board because um, they never let their guard down, and I think that's one of the keys to um, a lot of successful public open space is that you have to get the community buy-in, you have to give it love, you have to um, treat it like it's an important part of the, um, of the public realm where people live. 
Um, there's, again, programming is unmatched. The management's the best in the country. We have a lot of projects in urban cities and nothing's like Clyde Warren Park. So, um, and this is the section. I, we talked to the students today about this. Uh, it's complicated, but that's the drop slab where you do the box beams and then you drop it. And if you uh, walk through the park, you'll notice that every 25 feet or so, you'll see there's a tree, there's a tree, there's a tree. Uh, it's not like uh, you know a French formal uh, alley where you where you really get it because there's movement in the park, but there are trenches where you can put trees, and then there's foam, and then there's concrete where, where there's no room to plant any trees. Most of the park is is no room to plant any trees. Um, the plan is really a series of outdoor rooms. Um, it starts with the botanical interest, the children's garden, the reading room, the restaurant the grab and go, the performance pavilion, the groves, uh, which are on the south and the north, and then uh, the uh, dog park and, uh, and uh, Moody Plaza, which is a, a really important water feature. Uh, this shows before and after. Uh, again, we think it's been a, a really nice contribution to the community, and it feels like you can move through it. That was important that people might live in uptown and walk to a building downtown and not not feel like hardwood was encumbering anything so you could kind of move through the space shade was a big part of the design we know in dallas and all of texas you know the southwest if you don't have shade you really don't have life people will not go there so we purposely planted a lot of trees it's probably 65 percent shaded uh now and uh so that was a big part of the idea um this was really meant to show that you can connect and the streets keep going and it really does um, allow the urban realm to kind of move through. I think, um, again, the, the space sets up well if you have a small group of 100 or two, it does well and then if you, you can enlarge that to two or 3,000 and it still feels like you're, you're part of the, the, the program. Um, you know, this is uh, one of the slides I really love and uh, it's maybe because uh, nothing really is, you know, you can really see the diagram, you could see the movement, the plan, the, the, the intention. Um, but as I was telling the students today, you really don't perceive space like that. You don't see these big sweeping moves when you're in the park. Uh, you, you perceive space at two or 3,000 square feet at a time, and, and uh, you really do want to have shade, and you want to have a wide enough walk where you can walk on it. You want to have restrooms, you want to have water, uh, you want to have interesting plantings. Uh, so those are the things that kind of, I think, make this park a success. I, again, operationally, uh, is, is, it's, it's just a, that's really a big thing. Movable chairs were a nice addition. Dan Biederman really pushed on that, and we thought it would be great. We had done that um, on a couple of other projects, and it really did kind of make a difference that the chairs are out there, and you know, they're, they, they allow you to kind of make your own environment. Um, the, uh, I think <clears throat> inviting the community, the, the, the greater community, people that live nearby and people that live 30, 40 miles away and people, you know, because we, I hear stories all the time of people that live in Plano or Frisco or Cedar Hill or I have some family in the area and they, they say, well, we went down to Clyde Warren, we went to the DMA. It's so great that the DMA opened uh, to be free on the same day that we opened the park. And so that really kind of was a nice, that was a really nice gesture to say, come over here, see some art, be a part of the, you know, the, the art community. And, uh, and then you I should also know, note that they, re, they reoriented their museum front towards the park. Yes. Hint, hint, Nasher. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, that would be great. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I talked to Pete last week. He would love to do that for you. So I think we've just made a deal here. <laughs> so uh, I know we want to we want to wrap it up, but I think the the children's garden was another one of those surprises. There's no families living downtown. Why why, why would there be a lot of kids? I always thought, kind of like Oklahoma City, I saw these buses lining up down Harwood Street going to the DMA. And I said, those kids are going to enjoy this park. Let's have a children's garden. we got to have it for those kids. And then the Perot came on. we got to have it for those kids. 
and and lo and behold, there's a lot of families with kids downtown, and uh, I people tell me all the time that they now feel like they've got um, the support structure, they've got their office, they've got their health club, the, you know, schools are coming in. So Dallas is really an amazing livable city, and uh, and it, you know, I think I think having places for program that you're not too sure about is not a bad idea. If you want something to happen, we've we designed dog parks that have made the difference in, in developers building some really important projects that uh, include affordable housing. And so, you know, a fifty thousand dollar dog park might be the lever for a two hundred million dollar project. So we've it's it's kind of amazing to see how program open space program can impact the city. Um, and so Moody Plaza, again, one of my favorite places at the park uh, to sit and kind of watch the kids run through this and create uh, their own environment. And uh, finally, uh, Mariana Green really made my day when she wrote a story about the park, uh, how the park planting design captured the spirit of Blackland Prairie and that this was a kind of a new, a new direction for, for the, some of the open space and that she hoped that that would happen on other projects and of course, uh, there's some great designers and friends of mine that have been working in the city and they've uh, really uh, showcased uh, some amazing other other parks that that have uh, incredible focus on uh, plant and uh, and uh, biodiversity so um, I think this maybe back in the day ten years ago it was kind of exciting to see that but it's it's become commonplace now um, so and again, maybe the final thing that I think people uh, really like to do is uh, is people watch. You know, it's just to, it's just to be there, right? Like to to go out there on a nice day uh, and find a place where you can you know get in some shade um, and uh, listen to some music or get something to eat or drink and and uh, just kind of enjoy being uh, in the in the in the green at the green at, at Clyde at Clyde Warren. Um, this is a little one-minute movie and then a uh, film, and then we can we can start the questions. I I know that uh, you've probably been there. It's you know across the street. But uh, again, Mark was asking me what what were some of the big ideas, and I think we were nervous that we wouldn't be able to tame the feeder roads, that they would still be loud and fast, and so we have these kind of layers of landscape. So there's a sidewalk, and then there's planting. Those are the food trucks are, and then there's a, the groves. So we really push that in. Uh, it's the cars just crawl around. That I watched them today. Now it was busier this afternoon, but uh, it's really nice to see how uh, people do kind of slow down around the park, and it's it's not it's not the way it once was. Um, so with that, uh, I'd, maybe we like to. Mark's going to hammer me with some trick questions first, but. <laughs> Well, you did bring up Clyde Warren Park. Uh. Um, <laughs> you know, I think we're all, I think I can speak for everybody in Dallas and in this room when I say how grateful we are uh, for Clyde Warren. And, you know, you, you gave Dallas a, a front lawn, uh, the public space in downtown that it never really had, the, 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 the democratic public gathering space that. You know, we, we have other parks. We have Reverchon, City Hall Plaza, but nothing, nothing really like a front, a front lawn. Um, and you gave that to the public, and part of the problem with that is that uh, now it's ours and we like it. Um, and um, I think uh, we have a lot of reservations about uh, things that are being done to it uh, because we consider it ours now. Um, and maybe it was ours all along, but that's the thing with public-private partnerships. It's maybe the public doesn't always have as much uh, control over its uh, parks as or whatever that partnership is controlling as it as it as it might. Um, so we have uh, two major changes coming to the park. Uh, on one side, uh, the uh, uh, I guess the uh, east side, uh, this enormous fountain. Uh, that I've written quite uh, disparagingly of. Um, and on the other, perhaps even more troubling, um, a giant structure, uh, basically a garage, 
um, uh, structure. Um, so my question to you is, I should say, is like, aren't these things terrible and why, why, what can we do to stop it? <laughs> but um, I mean, uh, uh, what is your sense of, of, of these, of these uh, did you, why don't you tell me what your thoughts about these, these additions to the, to the Spark are? Well, first the founder. And I, I told him I was going to do this. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. Sorry, can't so, help but ask. Yeah. I'm work for a newspaper. <laughs> Put you on the spot. So, well, um, I uh, I think it's amazing that uh, that when a need arises, no one says, "Oh, well, let the next guy figure that out." I mean, this board at Clyde Warren Park is really pretty amazing. They um, figured out how to raise the money. They've um, you know, said we need more program for different things, and uh, and they've they're fulfilling that by adding on to the deck. Um, we've always imagined there'd be water along Pearl, and we thought of it as a kind of a gateway water feature that would announce the arts district and uptown. Um, you know, I think Jim Garland's a good designer. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's something that uh, we haven't. Uh, it, you know, we haven't been involved with as much as maybe in the master plan. Our role right now is expanding the children's garden, which we really are excited about. That's taking the botanical interest areas along St. Paul, 6,000 square feet, and taking down that fence and moving the children, taking it from 14,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet. And uh, I think that's going to really be good because there are times on Saturday when a docent actually has to keep people from coming into the children's garden because we've, we've hit capacity and we need more restrooms and there's some other program that's coming along with that. I think um, the building um, is um, David Epstein's building, the Gensler building, is, is beautiful. I know we, we might disagree on that, but I think he's a very good architect. Um, and I think it fulfills a lot of the, the foundations, uh, the you know, the board's needs for event space that is um, where they're protected for special events and um, to have ability to raise money for the park going forward. So, um, you know, I think that's uh, in that lawn, the Jacobs lawn is something that uh, they've been talking about for quite a while. So I think that those two things kind of work hand in hand as, you know, when you get on that side of the, the park, it, it becomes uh, more special events, maybe less day-to-day -day kind of activities. We'll leave it there. Okay. Uh, Let's <laughs> we'll stay in Dallas for a second because you mentioned that the, there has been this uh, efflorescence of park building in, in Dallas as part of the uh, Dallas Park, uh, a product of this Dallas Park Plan. And we have the Parks for Downtown Dallas organization, um, which has done a phenomenal job uh, right. in building uh, parks downtown, extraordinary, extraordinary parks. I, you know, biased. It's you know Robert Deckard, who's the CEO of the Dallas Morning News. I come uh, so come clean there. I have to you know <laughs> full disclosure. Uh, they're amazing, whether he's is or not. Um, but uh, the question to you is like, so we've actually built all these wonderful parks. Um, but my question to you is uh, broader. It's and it's something you, you touched on. Is where does landscape architecture stop and start? Because we have these great parks, but um, there's, they kind of, if the park just stops at the, the edge of its parkness uh, at its border, then do you, are you really improving the city? Or, or, I mean, you are, but I mean, we really still have this connectivity problem where we have these isolated um, parks. And how do, how do you fix that problem? <clears throat> I think that's a really good question. I think you, I think you do it uh, inch by inch. I think you, you look at those cross sections, and and I do think that um, what we try to do, we don't always, we're not always successful, but we try to look outside of the lines of our project and say, um, how do people get here? Can we make this connection better? Can we uh, create street trees and walkability, accessibility? Uh, kind of intelligent way to, to manage the, the approach and to try to connect some of these things together. There are uh, a number of really cool parks that have been built and are planned um, here in Dallas. And I think, 
I think that's the next evolution is to say, do we really need four lanes that are 13 feet wide? Could we, could we deal with three lanes that are 11 and, uh, you know, have a left turn pocket and then, and take that excess and create promenades, double alley promenades. Can we, can we grab a couple of those little out parcels that really are not buildable, but they're little funny triangles and little, you know, can, you know, cause I think it's, it's really just looking at it at the fine grain, but you'll be surprised how much real estate is unclaimed, left over, not really unclaimed, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's out there if someone wants to say, let's make a plan, let's, let's take everything from Clyde Warren inboard and look at all the streets and uh, work with a really good planner, uh, planning team and see if, uh, how many inches we can get out of that because you'll be surprised, it all adds up. Um, it really does. Um, you know, a lot of these lanes are too wide. Um, uh, sidewalks might be too wide. They probably aren't, but they're, they might be in some cases. So, um, you know, I think that um, you just kind of take it, take it street by street, block by block. Yeah, I feel like the, the, we have these organizations, these tactical urbanisms, urban organizations, right. a better block. They're terrific at finding these yeah. uh, unused spaces and right. demonstrating how they could be used to sort of ameliorate the, the, the street grid. And, and right. uh, But translating that, those, in the, the, that, you know, formative idea into like urban policy and real, long-term planning instead of these short-term, you know, like quick and dirty things, which are great and yeah. all for them. That's a, that's a big challenge. Well, the other thing you could do is <clears throat> what if you, it sounds crazy, but what if you gave up some of the streets and just made them, you know, I mean, Paris is doing this now. I mean, there, it's, a, it's a different scale, but if you just said, we're going to make green, green, this is going to be a green street and we've worked out the access and and the owners of these buildings are willing to um, come in on the side or the dart runs this way and the roads are running this way. Let's just take it and make um, a forest of trees running all the way through town. I mean, it would be really cool. And you could, you could probably get, I mean, in Dallas, you could probably get people behind that. We'll see. Uh, I think it sounds good. <laughs> that didn't sound very convincing, does sounds it? Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Fewer cars, yes. Uh, that is always the answer, or often the answer. Uh, it's just a tough, can be a tough sell here. I, I want to flip back a little, and we'll come back to present, but you, you started out talking about your history and about your first project, but maybe you could tell us, uh, I think your path into landscape architecture uh, and stardom uh, is a little unusual. Um, so maybe you could talk about where you're actually from and how you became interested in the field at all and to begin with and what some of your formative influences <clears throat> were. Okay, it might not be that interesting, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, I grew up in, in uh, partly in Dallas uh, till I was about in third grade, then I moved to my parents moved to Baton Rouge, uh, and uh, I was always kind of outdoors a lot in Baton Rouge. I loved to fish. I mean, it was, you know, we didn't live on a bayou and do canoes or piros or anything like that, but we lived in a, you know, in a subdivision like most people, uh, right, grow up in subdivisions. But I, I, I uh, really loved being uh, in the Chafalai Basin, fishing. I uh, wasn't a big hunter, but I was a big fisherman. And I just loved photography, so um, went to school at LSU, went into architecture, moved into landscape the first year, really felt like that was a better fit for me. And um, it's a really great program. There's some amazing professors there who kind of uh, fueled the, the, the ideas and the flame and really got me to learn how to draw and do some other things. So uh, when I left LSU, um, I went to Florida for one year. I'd worked intern uh, for a, an architect, a golf course architect down there, and it just really uh, wasn't the right place. I, uh, when I graduated, I came to Houston, worked for CRS Architecture, a uh, very large firm. At that time, they were the largest firm in the country. So my first day on the job, I was flying around, uh, you know, going to work on projects outside of Houston and worked there for five years and then started in 1989 with 
with one intern um, in uh, River Oak Shopping Center in, in Houston. And um, yeah, we, I never had an idea that um, we would be uh, 100 people in five offices. That was not my goal. In fact, um, one of my heroes and, and kind of mentors through a lot of this was Pete Walker. And, and he said 12, stay at, stay at 12, that's the magic number. You, you gotta stay at 12. Now he broke that rule too. But um, I, uh, and he also said that nothing important happens in the middle of the country. You gotta be in Cambridge or Berkeley if you wanna do meaningful work. And so uh, I, uh, I, you know, said, well, let's see. How Hold that on goes. a second. When you told me this story previously, it was, you, you said it was nothing important ever happens in Houston, which. <laughs> <laughs> A lot more appealing for a Dallas audience. <laughs> okay, nothing. I don't agree. I don't agree. I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah. So okay, so nothing really happens in Houston, but uh, and that, that's. I love H Town. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah. Well. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, the the idea that uh, you know we would start a firm in Houston and see how it goes. I I. Uh, um, was very nervous about kind of jumping off and, and doing my own practice because, uh, you know, I really had a good thing at, at, at CRS and I was traveling a lot. It was very exciting. Big teams. You learn so much at the office from all the different people and just go to a, a 250 square foot um, office by myself. Uh, and then I graduated, got a, you know, intern. And so then things started evolving from there. But. Uh, you know that the chance to uh, move to San Diego was was pretty amazing. It was, uh, and at that time, my boys were three and five, and uh, and Chip was uh, said just do it. You know, well let's do two offices, and I'll stay in Houston. And so he gave me the confidence to move out there. We were working for um, the Salk Institute with the two gentlemen that had worked for. Lou Khan and they uh, were part of the whole um, the whole experience with with Lou and Jonas through building that important building, and so um, moving west seemed like a natural thing to do. Uh, I was coming back every week the first year, and then it got to where I was coming back less and less, and then we really got a real office in San Diego. So, but um, you know, I I think that uh, you know the 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 great thing about landscape architecture is that uh, although there are there are plant colonies and you know there's there's zones and diversity issues and all that with the with uh, plants and the way you practice with fire regions and dry regions and flooding regions and all that I think um, I, I'm proud of our team because I think we've we've been able to kind of take on projects in other cities and and not feel like the out-of-town guys. You know, we do a lot of, we spend a lot of time doing research and getting prepared for our meetings, and we've uh, had, you know, really great consultants that help us and make us, you know, make us work, make things work in these other, other environments. So, I mean, I think it's interesting that you started in, in architecture and switched to landscape architecture. I, you've now been in practice for 30 years, and my sense is that, like, the, the relationship between architecture and landscape architecture has dramatically changed in those 30 years. Oh, yeah. And also, changed. landscape architecture, I think, has changed dramatically in those 30 years. Um, I mean, we could do a whole seminar on that, but, um, or two. But maybe you'd just like to well, relatively briefly talk about, like, the changes you've seen in, in these relationships and in the profession. I think it it has changed quite a lot. I I think again you you know that's why I would always encourage the students here to uh, to really shoot for the stars and and work with uh, work work with the you know the best people you can work with who are inspiring to work with because one of the first things I did at CRS now I'm two or three years out of school was work with Peter Walker and Paul Kennett on a project and and. Uh, he just really elevated what we could do because I was working for a really great firm, but it was a firm of 3,000 people. And uh, Pete came in and really kind of shook everything up and flipped landscape on its head and really created some amazing ideas on a very simple project we did in Clear Lake. And uh, so I do think that um, 
having ins inspirational people kind of widen your horizon. So we we gravitated towards people that want to work with us that um, you know treat us like equal partners, and that uh, there have been a few instances where we were asked to do. Um, you know, planting design only, or things that were after the architect had kind of completed the diagram early on, but that's changed quite a lot. And the the teams, we, the architecture teams we work with now are very collaborative. I think I think the whole profession of design is uh, a lot more collaborative. And in a weird way, Zoom was very peculiar, but we had so many meetings on things, and you got to present full screen in front of so many people, not in the back of the room or, you know, if you missed the meeting or whatever, you didn't really miss any meetings. There was, a, I, I, I would take the optimist view on, on the pandemic. It was terrible for so many things, but there were moments when I really felt like we had uh, really great collaborations with people that we might not have met with when you had to all go there and you know, they presented before you got there, or they left, or whatever. You, you know, there was a lot of focus, uh, focused effort. Now, you know, probably we were all worn thin at moments, but I do think. Uh, so, answering your question, uh, there's some great architects who really dig landscape, and uh, and then they listen to us, and we move the building around, and we're asking questions about the skin and the glazing and how it's going to reflect the landscape and you know all those things and 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 they're asking us about the plants and you know can we bring it inside or what can we do to really make this one seamless composition where we're both speaking the same language you know same dialogue and i think those are those are what makes you want to you know get up each day is that when you know that um, you've got the spirit of collaboration. Yeah, it really feels like landscape architecture has gone from subcontractor to almost like the discipline that's <laughs> subcontractor. The, the discipline that's driving discussion. And um, now, just you know, it just seems like an incredibly um, I, I, right now. I, it's hardly you can imagine anything more important. If it, we learned anything in the pandemic, it's that you know the landscapes that we we need our land to be in our landscapes more and more um uh, than ever uh that we mm -hmm. value that they're more valuable than we realize that we're in them more often need to be in them more often and at the same time they're more endangered by climate um i feel like there's like more i mean are you feeling that, that coming from your clients uh, that that there's more uh intensity on, on your on your work a lot more intensity, a lot more, um, I wouldn't call it pressure because we like it, but a lot more focus on um, how do we get people to use it? How do we get them outdoors? How do we create a lot of, a lot of what we're doing with um, Workplace is trying to create uh, environments where people can go outside. They've got, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, they've got fans, they've got power, they've got everything they can do inside could be outside. On a day like today, you could... You could have meetings, maybe, maybe until the afternoon. It might have gotten a little hot uh, in the afternoon, but you know, you could actually host meetings outside, and not, and I don't mean uh, at a at some landscape forms furniture, or a picnic bench, or something. I mean, like, you could really have a monitor outside and really do work. And so we're we're testing that pretty pretty heavily right now in a lot of our campus projects. Um, I mean, it's proven that. When you're outside, uh, you the, the cells in your body change. Your metabolism changes. You're happier. Uh, you're more creative. Uh, even five or ten minutes of being outside, coming back, uh, it's a dramatic shift in the way you look at things. So uh, getting a dose of that through the day, having meetings outside, having lunch outside, I mean, that's probably all we've ever done uh, a lot of is just have lunch outside. People would say, well, there's an outdoor dining terrace on this side. We want to make sure, you know, we have tables and umbrellas, have people outside. But we're going way past that now. We're really trying to put people outside three or four hours a day. I, my time is running low. So I'm going to ask you one last question. I okay. think it's an important one for this audience, especially. Um, 
I think there, there are people here who commission landscape both for their homes and for their businesses. What's the most important thing they need to be thinking about when they're talking to a landscape architect? <laughs> <laughs> Aside from knowing your number. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, number is the least important thing, right? <laughs> no. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I'm just tired an architect for a home I'm building, and uh, I like I like the idea that uh, he's very uh, organized. And uh, he's actually uh, listening to me, and I think that's a big thing. I mean, um, it's in the end, it's you that will uh, will live there or work there, or uh, you know, I, 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 what we try to do is synthesize the program of what we hear, and then we try to give the client something they never imagined they could have, but it still fits their program. So. I think that's uh, really important that you, um, you know, you really kind of um, you get the get the program right and make sure that you're you're doing something. And I, I know a lot of times um, we don't know what what we want, right? When you're buying design services, um, you might not know the answer. But uh, I do think it's it's important to have somebody who you can trust and and who uh, you align with. I mean, if you're listening to 97.7, you don't want someone who's listening to 104.5 and, you know, it's going to give you something that's too loud and it's, uh, it's uh, hopefully that's not a, like a bad channel or something in Dallas. <laughs> I, 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 I don't even know what those mean in Dallas, but, but you know what I mean? Like you need to kind of be in the same frequency. You need to be respectful and understanding and have a, and it needs to be a dialogue. I mean, most of my clients draw, or I push them to draw, or show me what you mean. And Jody draws a lot. He's really good at that. He's, uh, I, I, I love the fact that he's, uh, you know, he's, he's out there. He's, he's interested in, uh, I, don't, I don't know that he draw draws, but he, you know, he gives us advice and, and input. And uh, I, think it's, I think you have to, for a great relationship, you have to have that uh, give and take. So get somebody who's, who's really going to, and someone who understands uh, all the technologies, the, the people, I, I don't know, this may step on somebody's toes, but I, I would not hire someone who's, who's taking a marker out using trace paper and drawing, you know, squares on top of 2D plans. I mean, it, it, you don't need to have that. You can go into that space. You can walk through it. You can see what your existing trees look like. You can, you can experience the 3D experience. Um, the, most architects, landscape architects, have those kind of tools now. So why not uh, put the goggles on and see what it's really going to be like before you buy something? So. Put the goggles on, drink the Kool-Aid. Um, <laughs> and with that, I think maybe we could take some questions from the audience, although maybe we could turn off the, the projector because it's so bright I can't see anything. Um, maybe, Jim, you can. I don't I can't really see either. Uh, if someone's got their hand raised, uh, great. <laughs> Ask a question. I, there's no way to see it. Oh, there we go. Hello. I want to give a shout out to uh, your team that's working on Aggie Park. Uh, All right. Jeff and I are very honored to be working uh, alongside of your team. And for those of you who may not know, uh, it's going to be a transformation for our campus. But I wanted to touch on something you said earlier. Um, I think a lot of times design professionals don't really think about it. But you said it, we can create something from nothing. And the Clyde Warren Park is an excellent example. And so I think I just wanted to thank you for inspiring the rest of us. Now, Mark may say, yeah, sometimes what we created and the prettiest or the best, but you do inspire us to think beyond. And I want to thank you. Wow. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. And this is the team for Aggie Park uh, right here on the second row. And uh, we're very excited to be a part of that. Um, I do think uh, making the uh, unseen scene is one of the one of our goals that we really work to. Um, you know, I guess I used to be a little bit more of a doubting Thomas the first part of my career because I, 
I would see so many presentations, you know, where we would show a lot of things and, and they wouldn't get there. Right now, it's it just feels really great to kind of be in the flow where where when we propose something, we can we can again move it move it along, and uh, and that people are interested in doing it, and then we we can find uh, you know we can find supporting ideas that might might help uh, push push those uh, those visions because but again it takes a it takes a real visionary client. Um, to uh, to build an Aggie Park, I mean, it, it's um, or to build a Clyde Warren Park too. So um, again, these are these things are really interconnected. You know, having someone that pushes you, but then you having ideas that are not dismissed. So, thank you. Yes. I I don't know if I entirely um, got the visual. But it seems you uh, pointed out. It seems you pointed out um, plantings in Clyde Warren that honored the neighborhood, the past. It, did I miss something, or did I invent something in my mind? We were just using plants that were plants. <clears throat> part of the Blackland Prairie, the area Thank in you. the, uh, you know, the the kind of grasslands in the area. So. I think um, part of what appeals to me in this and in landscape architecture is honoring the past, uh, incorporating what is here. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a little shout out, I have been involved not as a great contributor, but involved at Parkland Hospital. And they, are plant they, they have in the works a garden near the Ron Anderson uh, Client Center that will bring the whole awareness of the terrible disgrace of Dallas, losing JFK in Dallas at Parkland, but they will make it into a garden of memory. Mm. Wow. And, and it is a beautiful piece, as I've seen the, the renderings, and it will make us all aware that this is part of our history, and it's, it's part of the landscape. Anyway, I'm just happy to see it, and I feel that it's an important part of landscape architecture, bringing the past. I think that's a really important point. A um, number of our projects have, have been memorial gardens, and they've dealt with um, kind of recognizing um, the past and, and individuals that you know, may have contributed to the community. I'll say this, to, to per, pump in there, but uh, to me, I think we could use some landscape architecture in Dealey Plaza, uh, turning uh, that, uh, that triple underpass, or at least parts of it, into a memorial park uh, against, you know, political violence. Uh, the Martyrs Park is right there. Uh, it's obscene that people just drive right over those paint, uh, you know, crassly painted X's. Someone's going to get killed by you know one of these assassination tourists. We've got the Holocaust Museum right there. It's like the perfect opportunity to, and of course, uh, you know, the Trinity Park. It, that's going to be the path from downtown to the Trinity Park, uh, and Dawson uh, Prison will become like a gateway. I, uh, so it's a perfect place for us to think about uh, justice issues and create a walkable landscape between downtown um, and, and the Trinity. Uh, this is a place to, to do something like that. Okay, I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that, that was my question uh, as well. As if you were hired, to get us to the river, what would you do? <laughs> <clears throat> well, like I said, it's a game of inches, right? You can, uh, no. I, uh, you know, I'd have to really uh, walk it with you a few times. I know, I know it's a circuitous path and there's, you know, flyovers and freeways and there's a lot of things that 
you were talking about like the heart of downtown from this building to the river, how would you get there? Well, and also the loose there. <clears throat> Last time I asked this question, five years ago, they're like, well, we're just gonna move it. They're gonna move what? I'm sorry, didn't the jail. Oh, the jail. Yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I think we're, we're, we're uh, yeah. <laughs> We're asking too much of Jim here to be able <laughs> to close down our a prison system. <laughs> close down the prison justice system. system. <laughs> you already fixed a highway. How much do we want from the guy? No, I mean it's it's a fact. It's unfortunately was built first, and now we're going to put a park on the other side of it. How do you get from here to there? Yeah, and you've got this jail. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I would have to do a little more homework to get ready for that, that one, but it, I, I do think there are a lot of puzzles like that in cities where you're like, that's a big thing, we got to get people to it, how do we get there, and uh, you know, it's connecting the dots, and uh, again, where there's a will, there's a way, I mean, um, there have been some, I know the High Line was not, uh, you know, it was not like designed to be a pedestrian way, but it does some amazing things that no one ever imagined it would do, right? It's really kind of connected to that city in a lot of ways, so. Yes, in the back. I'm sure you must be familiar with this wonderful building in London, I can't think of the name of it, where the internal and upper floors are levels of garden and restaurants and open air cocktail places and are you familiar with this building? It is absolutely the most marvelous building of outdoor, indoor. I've never seen anyone come up with something like that for Dallas in all the new construction that seems to be more um, going higher and broader and maybe putting glass but not thinking of it as the indoor, outdoor space. And I appreciate that you're looking at outdoor spaces to uh, enhance office buildings, but what about that concept? Are you familiar with that building? I'm sure it's famous. I, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, it sounds amazing. Norman uh, Foster, maybe? Yeah. Sounds like the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank in Hong Kong, right. but. Uh, it's huge. I mean, yeah. it's a huge office building, and it's a very prominent place. I just can't think of the name. Yeah. And you just you take an elevator, uh, and all shard, of a sudden maybe, you're in an in, indoor yeah. outdoor, and there are trees and plants and. I my was. Husband will think of it. I, I I'm sorry, I don't know that building, but I have seen oh, some well, really. Oh, you should. That I, is I, absolutely I, what I, you do. I, I, I will. I will. I will look into that. There are a lot of amazing buildings in Singapore, uh, that are green inside and out, and uh, they've done an incredible job of making green growing buildings that actually filter the air on the skin. I was in Milan a couple of weeks ago, and there's uh, a building at Porto Nuova, the green building that's, that goes up about 25 stories, residential building, uh, Boeri, right? Uh, and 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 it's and it's it's green on the skyline. It's all green all the way up. It's it's pretty pretty amazing. I actually think a lot of Dallas buildings or taller Dallas buildings are trying to incorporate green spaces and uh, open terraces, like. Kengo Kuma's Rolex Tower is a beautiful uh, landscaped um, enclosed terrace um, and it, at one of its top levels. Um, just throwing a lot of trees on the outside of architecture, it, sometimes it, it looks neat and it sounds good, like, oh, it's green, but it, trees don't really necessarily thrive on the, uh, green doesn't always thrive on the outside of, of tall buildings. There's wind and uh, all kinds of in reasons why it's hard to grow things um, in the air. That's where, not generally where things uh, naturally grow. So, but the, I'd leave that to, uh, I mean, the, obviously there are, uh, is a movement to do more uh, green uh, building, but uh, there are serious, um, uh, like uh, breaks on the, uh, how, re how realistic some of that can be. That's right. So, Jim, you were um, with the students today, and you know, we always talk about how it's great to have people like you come out to talk to them. But on the flip side, you always walk away taking things from the things that they showed you. So, what were the takeaways from the students today? 
Well, I thought the, <clears throat> the questions were good. There was uh, a lot of interest in uh, why we didn't stop the park at Pearl Street. You know, it's like you kind of don't have a buffer on that end. Uh, why do you let it kind of bleed off into a five lane, six lane road right there? And uh, my answer was that I always imagined that um, when we did some kind of water feature that we would have a restraining device there. We would even have some planting and so we would soften it a bit as we developed that last piece of the park on the east side. Uh, there was another good question about structural you know, engineering, how do you, how do you make the park, you know, how do you get the trees in? And we, I explained, you know, like I did earlier, that there's trenches through the park where pipes and water and conduit and foam and all that happens. But most of the park is not dirt. Most of the park is, uh, is concrete and blue foam that's high density. So it's, it's kind of um, amazing when you're out there that it does feel like you're on ground and you're in a park, but it's not that way. There were some other good questions. I think I think you guys had a lot of a lot of good uh, good good observations. Yes. Has your firm been involved in the South Dallas Deck Park? We started the Gateway Deck Park. Deck Park had a number of great community meetings at the zoo. Um, we uh, did master plan kind of concept design for that project. And then they've uh, changed firms and they've they kind of went dormant for a while and then changed firms. But we worked to TxDOT to get the the deck calculations figured out. We, we went quite a ways on the Southern Gateway project, if that's the one you're talking about. Um, and then now it's moved to another firm. Um, so, but I do think that's a really interesting project because it's a lot different than Clyde Warren Park. At least during our programming, we were looking at uh, the zoo being interfacing into that, having speakers that would bring animals over, that would kind of make it like interactive so people didn't have the chance to go to the zoo, but they came to that park, they would still have programs tied in with the zoo. So a lot of shared programming there. We had a kind of a boys and girls community center on that park, which was really community focused. The food and beverage was all meant to be local merchants in Oak Cliff that would be part of that. Um, you know, there was uh, a lot of things that were kind of about the cliffs of Oak Cliff and the children's garden with the stone ledgers and stone from the limestone cliffs in Oak Cliff that we were putting in. So I, I'm, I'm sad that we're not working on that anymore. I really wish we would have kept going, but uh, you know, sometimes these things, at least we got it going and we were worked with John Reynolds at the city and others and really kind of um, made a, a real push to kind of get, get through the first year and then uh, wish them the best. We hope it, hope it, hope it goes well. I mean, I'm, I know it's going to go well. They're, they're in good hands. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen the final design. That'll be my answer on that. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, so uh, when I first came to Dallas, I actually moved really close to where Clyde Warren Park is, and it was something I was really impressed with, like the impact that it had on the city and sort of looking at the before and after, it's quite... I guess amazing to me, um, but I guess currently I, I live in Austin right now, and there's like a lot of they have plans to sort of redo the section of I-35 uh, kind of by downtown. So I was wondering, um, I guess in y'all's experience, is there any particular way I guess that you feel that uh, you've been able to change people's minds, of sort of getting out of like the one more lane will fix it type of mindset that seems to be quite stubborn. A lot of people. Um, you know, I think it's just it's just um, you know you find out in traffic that they grade streets, right? They have different gradations, A, B, C, and all that of different uh, cycles of lights and how how fast you can move through through a city through through the 
through the uh, congestion. And, uh, you know, a lot of our projects when we, when we went under construction, even Clyde Warren Park, you know, when we had everything shut down, people still found a way to get to the tollway. They still found a way to make their way through. So I think, you know, the proof is, um, you know, if, if, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of flexibility. Most traffic engineers, not all traffic engineers, most of them really want to err on the side of um, providing more capacity than less. You know, they like to kind of build the church for Easter Sunday. And I think, uh, I think you find out that you don't need all that capacity. And in fact, if you didn't have it, people might use transit more. They might share rides with people. They might uh, do something different. They might actually ride a bike. So there's other other things that um, people you have do. Have a hammer. You're always looking for a nail. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the, the cover the of uh, tomorrow's the newspaper. Philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> engineers. Yeah. That's good. I like it. I think we have. Time for one more question. Okay. Hi, um, you were talking about, I think it was called Spring Creek Park with the retention ponds. And um, that reminded me of what my company helped design. We helped design um, Able Pump number three. Um, that was with nine retention ponds and our, our initial design was to have um, trails you know, along the sides and you were saying when it floods, it floods, but otherwise it's a park. So I was wondering um, if you think that's gonna be a, a trend or is Spring Creek uh, very far along in, in the progress? I was wondering how it was doing. It's completed. So uh, that project, um, the drainage corridor for, uh, and Chip, you, what, what's the official name for that? Well, it's, it's uh, Springwoods in Houston. Yeah. It's City Park. Okay. Springwoods and City Park, and it's uh, north of Houston, south of the Woodlands, uh, and it works. It uh, and I know there was there was a number of people involved. I think the developer had some role, and then the the county flood control district had some role, and the mud district had some role. So there was a lot of different utilities and interest in in building that and creating that kind of capacity there. But I think that's a trend. I think you're onto something. There's going to be a lot more parks that you just, you know, you just sweep them off after they flood, and uh, you know that's that's what you do. And and we're going to have, uh, uh, you know, sea level rises is, is on is 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 here, and it's you know coming. And there's going to be a lot of times when uh, you just have areas that that are designed to handle floods and and then you know they they kind of get cleaned up and ready to go and you, you you do that again next year you do that every day i was in venice too uh in some of these houses they said uh well those are where the students live uh on the ground level and they uh actually they they put their furniture up during uh high tide and then they mop out their house and then it's good for another day. And I was thinking, man, that's pretty intense, right? But, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a fact of life. Climate change is here. It's, it's happening quicker than we thought. And I think that uh, we need solutions uh, for it. And I do think it's not, it's not uh, an engineered solution. It's not a landscape architecture solution. It's both and it's, and it's probably, a lot of other environmental engineers uh, in the mix too. So, all right. Well, okay. Jim, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.